uh, where can we even go to get away from these things? Do you have any ideas? Look, man, I don't think there is anywhere left, man. Being being back on Earth, it's fun while it lasted. But it's just not ours anymore. There's nowhere left. Game over, man. Game, game over. You know, there actually is one place we could go. We could go back out. Out? Like, out into space? You mean back to the ship? Yeah. We get back to the podcast and just go. Like you said, man, these monsters have overrun the planet, so our only option is to go off the planet. <sighs> Fuck. Fuck. I don't really have any better idea. Um, let's do it. Okay, it says here there's an automated cargo shuttle heading to Gateway Station that I, I guess they forgot to shut down. Let's go. Okay, uh, well, a small bit of bad news. Gateway only has uh, one available dock, it looks like, and unfortunately, we're not currently the only ship trying to get there. See him out there? Uh, with a little luck, though, we should be able to... What the hell is that? What is that? What, what, what's the... Ah! the... Uh, 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 Neil, my man, is that... that is... That, that's a juggernaut, my dude. Jesus. We're gonna die, aren't we? We're gonna die. No, no, not yet. We won't. Um, hello, Gateway Station. This is Co-Captain Hallstrom of the USCSS podcast, currently on cargo transport uh, 417D alongside Captain Rohrbacher, requesting permission to board. Ah, oh, man, I gotta say, I don't think we're gonna get there in time, dude. This other shuttle, it's going real fast. It's going faster than us. I think that they're... Fuck, our ship, our ship. No, you know, it, actually, it's okay. It's all right. It looks like the docking arm broke. I think the ship is fine, though. But it, um, uh, the ship is floating away. Okay, that's it. I'm switching the shuttle to manual controls. We're going after it. Do you know how to fly this thing? I, uh, <laughs> I was kind of hoping you did. Crew, welcome to Crew Expendable, podcast all about the Alien franchise. I am actually a synthetic Hallstrom. And I am fuss-raising scientist Rohrbacher. And we are just a parasitic spore spreading our way across the planet Earth of the Alien franchise. <laughs> Ooh, baby. Oh, man. You see, I'm fine with, you, you know, this isn't. The first time I've been called a parasitic spore, and I called myself that, so, you know. Uh, you certainly did. I believe both of us at some point or another have referred to ourselves as a xenomorph or something like it on this show. <laughs> we are here. What are we talking about today, Co-Captain Kenny? Fuss, uh, we're fuss maker. About, fuss maker Kenny. It's Razor, not Maker. Get it oh, right. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Um, we're here to, uh, we're finally wrapping up the, uh, outbreak storyline by talking about the final two issues, numbers five and six. Yeah. We must be in 1989 at this point, right? Uh, we certainly are. They, I think they, I want to say they came out every other month, but if I'm wrong yes. about that, don't quote me on it. But I believe the series ended in like May of 89 or something like that. Yeah. The title page for both of these is showing 1988, but. We're not getting full credits on these uh, Marvel re-releases. Thanks, Obama. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, yeah. Issues five and six, closing out Mark Verheiden's first run on the Alien franchise. Dark Horse Comics' first uh, published story arc. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a minute since we've read these, right? We recorded, even though, even though the other two episodes have released, like the past two releases have been about these comics, it's been like a, a month or two since we read those. Uh, I believe uh, the previous issue for three and four, yeah. I believe we recorded those like a little over a month and a half ago as of this current recording. That tracks. Yeah. Then I got so sick. it's it's 
it's been a while. Yeah, we got sick and then we had or you got sick and then we right. had to cover the last couple Icarus episode or issues. Right. And it's like it's been almost two months since we like uh, I don't know about you, but it's been almost two months since I've read any issues of Outbreak. <laughs> yeah, I had the benefit of editing our episodes on those, which brought back a lot of the storyline. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I also did just remember things like. I just know Patrick Massey's name now. That's just a name <laughs> in my head for some reason. I hear you. We're going to learn a lot more about him in this episode. Actually, we're not going to learn about him. We're going to say goodbye to him. In this. We're, we're going we're gonna to see a lot more of him, but yeah. we're not really going to learn anything else about him. I guess this is the most like we really hear him like speak, right? Because he really sort of popped up and started talking at the end of issue four, I believe. All we know uh, is he yeah, was I a think that was one. murderous sociopath. Who killed yep, his wife. He sure was. Right. Do we need to do anything to catch people up on what's happened in these comics so far? Not as uh, like a formal, like, you know, segment, but just do we need to talk any of these details out before we dive into issue five? Uh, we should probably go over like the big ones and like the general gist of what's going on. Right. Just in case. So... Hicks broke a now adult newt out of a mental institution and sure. took her with him um, when him and the rest of his crew uh, go to what they believe to be the Xenomorph homeworld. Yes. Um, meanwhile, a uh, company, I don't remember what they're called, something Bio Bionational. Bionational, yeah. Um, they are sending this uh, insane murderous sociopath named Patrick Massey yeah. in another ship to follow Hicks's ship, which is called the Benedict, right? Um, to wherever it is they're going, so that he can basically uh, get onto the Benedict and take it over, and then just do whatever it was he was hired to do. Right. Um. Meanwhile. Um, on Earth, I believe it started in Houston, if I recall. Of course. Um, all that, uh, somebody. All that, sorry, all that deregulation, <laughs> you know. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, somebody uh, got face hugged and then gave birth to a queen. Right. With a crazy, insane religious guy mm -hmm. uh, somehow found out that xenomorphs exist and then um, led a group of what his what is now his cult members yes. into breaking into the spot where the queen is so that they can just like do whatever it was they were going to do. They wanted to and be of course, impregnated. They wanted to carry aliens. Well, good thing, because that's pretty much what happens yeah. to all of them. But because they broke in, um more aliens start breaking out, hence yes. the name of the comic Outbreak. Yo, that's and, where it came um, from. We start uh, seeing things start to happen re the xenomorphs all over. Yes. Meanwhile, the la one of the last things that happens is I believe it's actually how uh, issue four ends. Right. Is that uh, Massey gets onto the Benedict because we find out that the the captain uh, Stevens. I, I was gonna Stevens. I was gonna say Phillips, but I was like, no, that is a movie. <laughs> um, uh, captain Stevens turns out to be a traitor working for right. Bio National and lets Massey on the ship. And I believe the last thing Massey does is kill Stevens and right. then declare the ship to be theirs. Yes. While Newt is like in a vent, <laughs> classic Newt style, classic Newt watching style. all of this go on. Yes, Massey looked at Stevens and said, look at me. I'm the captain now. <laughs> it's a Captain dude, Phillips reference. Dude, that movie is so fucking good. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I just know that part from the trailer. It is it is extremely good, like the very, very ending of the movie, because since this yeah. isn't a spoiler, because it happened in real life, sure. uh, Captain Phillips gets rescued, and um, he's being given a physical at the very end of the movie, like on the ship they bring him on, because like he's in shock and all that, Sure. and Tom Hanks in that scene does legitimately some of the best acting I oh, have wow. ever seen in my entire life by anyone holy smokes i mean he's a good actor i i believe he, it. it 
he but this fucking is like... blew me away, man. That movie is like the end of that movie, especially, is so good, my guy. Nice. I gotta check it but out. But that is not here what we're talking what we're here to talk about. No, stay so. subscribe to our Patreon if you want to hear us watch Captain Phillips someday. <laughs> also, we don't have a Patreon. We certainly do not. That is correct. So a couple interesting things. First, uh, we should mention that while Newt was on this ship, the Benedict, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she did strike up a relationship with one of the grunts named Butler. She sure did. And yeah. that relationship quickly turned physical. So It, it did. I'm a little mm, about that because if this takes place 18 years after Aliens or 10 years after Aliens, pardon me, right? Mm -hmm. In issue six of this, Newt says that she was six when all the stuff on Acheron happened. So she's 16. We don't know how old this grunt is. Well, well, she's at least 17, because if you recall, there was a t uh, one year, at least a one year time skip. Okay. So she, because remember uh, when... Right. I believe You're it was right. when that one episode started and Hicks is like training all the rest of his crew. Right. Um, we figured out that the beginning of that issue, there was at least a one year time skip and all of those times that they needed to, you know, fly around because they go to the planet and come back and all that. That might have been a few months. So I'm guessing okay. she's 17 or 18. That's fair. But I'm hoping this grunt is like fresh out of high school. Right. <laughs> That'd be, that'd I mean, be uh, helpful, yes. Like, we're going to learn the truth about this grunt and all of the other Marines later on in the book, but we're not going to spoil that here. Um, even not though yet, anyway. presumably you've already read it. I like that I went to, like, this weird age thing, and it's like, honestly, that doesn't even matter. It does not. <laughs> that is correct. But it was something we talked about a little bit on a previous episode, so I wanted to touch on it. The other thing I wanted to mention is how silly it is that I'm just now realizing that this ship with this traitor on board is called the Benedict. Right? It sure is. <laughs> like classic Benedict Arnold reference. They should have seen it coming, honestly. Don't name well, your ship after uh, traitors, right? <laughs> Uh, I did not make that connection until after I was done reading the comic. Yeah, it's not, you know, obvious. Benedict sounds like a military ship, right? But then you really yeah, think about it, it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Benedict Arnold was a dude in the military. It makes sense for a military ship to be called that. It do. Should we jump into this bad boy? Issue five here is just, if I remember correctly, it's pretty much just what's going on in the alien homeworld, isn't it? I don't think we. Cut, um, I don't think we cut back to Earth at all during it. Um, I'm going through my notes just to check, and uh, no, it's all entirely uh, the Hicks and Newt storyline. Yeah, so we're probably gonna knock through this one pretty quick, since we're not jumping back and forth and have to reestablish what's going on. The issue does pick up right away with Newt hiding an event, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the opening, like, page, page and a half is her uh, going through the beginning stages of a panic attack. Yes. And uh, and uh, she manages to stop that pretty quickly, though, and get herself together. And then she, according to my notes, she begins pulling a Newt and crawling <laughs> into the vents. <laughs> Yeah, she That's makes kind of her standard move, you know, she's making some pretty interesting. She's doing this thing where she's like, I'm going to be like the alien. Right. She's not saying yeah. it. Well, she's kind of saying it. Right. But she's talking yeah, about she... how like these guys don't really know what they're up against. Right. Like they think they're in control and that's what the alien depends on, you know. Yeah, and she's talking about how she needs to be like, you know, cold and dispassionate and logical, just like these monsters are right. and all that. And so like throughout the next like little bit of the comic, we have like little brief insert panels of one or two at a time of her just kind of like stalking around like through the vents and in the undership, just monologuing to herself about how hard she needs to be to take care of this, you know? Yeah. And she's also reflecting on her relationship with Butler and how she found love and that kind of stuff. And now it's all being taken away again. I'd like, I like the idea of her, like, cause it, it's, that's an interesting parallel of the character Newt, who we found in aliens hiding in vents while we know that this is also a creature that hides in vents. Right. Mm -hmm. And she was doing it to be safe. Cause she could get places they can't, uh, can't access cause she was so much smaller than them. Right. Yeah. 
and now she here she is like using those same tactics to become the predator. It's yeah, I just I dig it. It's fun. It is cool. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a nice little fun thing. Like it's like both the same and different than what we've seen her do before. You know? Right. But uh, like I said, uh, as I mentioned, they have like little insert panels of her doing this while the other stuff is going on. And the other stuff that's going on is that uh, first off, we find out why uh, Stevens demanded that Hicks remove all the plasma rifles from the ship. Yes. Uh, in Hicks's in Hicks Hicks's exact words, because he knew we'd use them against you, right. and he says this to Massey after Massey uh, takes Hicks hostage. Yeah, yeah. Because remember, um, all of the firing pins or something had been removed from the Marines' rifles by mm -hmm. Steven. So presumably, plasma weapons can't be um, sabotaged as easily. Maybe, right. Uh, that's presumably what's going on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no way for us to know for sure, I guess, but it seems like a good, reasonable assumption. Right. And he's also um, like, Hicks is also like, can't believe a corporation would, would do this, like intercept a government ship. And Massey's like, yeah, uh, capitalism, dog. Like, he literally says, we still yeah. believe in free enterprise, capitalism, and I'm afraid your government wants to keep the alien life form for itself. Like, this is... Yeah, I, I yeah. literally have in my notes, this is how I describe that scene. Quote, Massey gives the blah, blah villain speech about how great capitalism is, comma. Yeah. Jeez, just like in um, uh, Alien Covenant Origins, the, the alien product we've probably referenced the most. It certainly <laughs> is. <laughs> With the despite with us all the doing like corporations, despite us doing like three months of aliens content, somehow Covenant Origins is the thing we've referenced the most. <laughs> it's such a weird. I mean, it, I, we've talked about it a hundred times. It's so thematically similar to this in so many ways, right? But you are correct. It is an insanely strange book. Yes, is. that is correct. It's growing on me. I think it might be my favorite <laughs> alien novel now. <laughs> Um, but uh, but yeah, um, after giving that speech, um, he says that they're uh, planning on, uh, you know, because he's here, Massey is here to like get the specimens. Right. And we find out his specific plan for how to get them. Yes. Is he's going to round up all of the non Hicks Marines. Right. And take them down to the surface and then just have them wander around until all of them are face hugged. And then he's just going to round all of them right. up and bring them back onto the ship and put them in stasis. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Like, it sucks, but, like, the plan, right? He's like, we're going to put the Marines on the ground uh, and we're going to march them into this hive structure, right? Whereas mm -hmm. his mercenaries, Massey's, Massey's mercs, as we call them, are um, airborne, right, in these, like, floating skiffs with these masks on their face. Just masks to breathe in the atmosphere yeah. easier, but yeah. also it's, like, secondary protection, protection against face huggers. Because mm -hmm. they know that the xenomorph is is ground based, like they call it a ground based enemy, right? So yeah, they're like, we're just not going to be on the ground, and we're going to use the marines as bait. They'll be on the ground with their faces uncovered, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's well thought out, just in terms of you know storyline wise. I I, guess. I did I did think that was a really clever way. Like if somebody were to be like, hey, how is this sociopath going to bring alien specimens back? Right. I would have just thought that he was going to like get one. It never occurred to me that his plan was just fuck it. Send all of yeah, them down I'm, there. I'm going to get as many as possible. Although his, his true mission is to keep the government from getting specimens. Right. Th that's true. Yes. Like, because I believe their plan is he grabs a bunch of specimens and then after he grabs them, they're going to destroy the hive sure. so that no one else can show up and get them. Right. And we do see, the hive yeah they land right outside of it uh massey's dudes who like i said or like you mentioned they're flying around and leading the marines around on foot right and uh they're being led into the hive and uh they get attacked by these uh weird lowercase a alien guys like <laughs> picture Picture uh, like a Ninja Turtle, but without the shell. <laughs> and instead they have big wings. Sure. That's kind of what they look like. Yeah. They're like lizard man, pterodactyl combinations. They're really weird. Drakes or something. They look kind of like, I mean, they look dragon like, right? 
Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And there's a whole swarm of them, and they fly in and attack like Massey's dudes that are flying around. Right. Yeah. Uh, at least two of them get killed and yes. the rest land and flee on foot into a cave. Sure. And the moment they step into that cave, they all get attacked by a bunch of Xenomorphs. Yes. Uh, Just me- a comedy of errors <laughs> over there. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Newt is creeping through vents, creeping through service doors. She does find a weapon. Obviously, the weapon doesn't fire. But she thinks like Stevens probably didn't throw away the the loaders is what she calls them. Yeah. Um, so that she figures he must be hiding them somewhere, probably in his quarters, right? She also talks all about how stupid all these fucking people are, right? She's like, these these mercs, these mercenaries are just like the fucking Marines on Atron. They're so unprepared for what they're getting into. And yeah. she's right. They a hundred percent are. Like it's yeah. the kind of it's that that hubris thing, right? Like you don't know what it's like to go up against these things unless you've gone up against them. And if you have, you're probably going to fucking die. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to ask you what you think of this planet that we're on. I, I don't, do we know the name of this planet? Um, I believe, uh, Xenopedia calls it like Xenomorph Prime, but I don't think that's actually said anywhere in this comic. So as far as I know, the comic itself never gives us a name for it, I think. I feel like they had given, okay, they did give a, a designation, um, G435. It says okay. Z- I, Xenomorph yeah, Prime. Yeah, I must not have noticed that. Also known as G four thirty five, Achilles two point four, Hive World, Home World, or A six four fifty four. Got a lot of names. Must be different names from different um, appearances, right? Yeah, I'm guessing it, this planet comes back in other comics. Then I assume. Yes, including the Alien Resurrection novel. It's mentioned Ooh. apparently, and the nice. 2010 Aliens versus Predator video game. That's Ooh. pretty sick. I wonder if the if it's consistent. Like probably the, not the depiction but. <laughs> of it is consistent because i wanted to ask you what you thought of the way this this planet looks it's kind of like rocky and craggy right mm-hmm. cliffs and stuff like that there is a little bit of green i feel like we see at some of the shots there's some some plant life and stuff right? i mean there definitely is because as we see with these weird uh flying lizard guys like mm-hmm. there are creatures that live on this planet it's not right. a barren rock like 426 is you know yeah Th- this place can support life sure so presumably there are like plants and stuff yeah and this hive itself is kind of a um not really a dome-like structure because it's got like an open cavity in the mm-hmm. center from the top right but it's like tall and it i mean it looks like a bug hive right looks like a beehive yeah. i don't know the a great way to describe it but i mean it is it is a vaguely dome shaped like i yeah. mean it's like i a, don't want you know what like, it is you know like a jello mold you know like when there someone, you go that's perfect or like a bunt cake yeah, or something like yes. a bunt cake that's it it's like that, that is a perfect description of it yes yeah it's like that shape bunt cake is perfect because then it's got the hole in the center too right so i mean it's 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 not the same proportionally like the hive is wider and not as tall but it has that general shape yes yeah um it's interesting it's a little plain in my opinion right i expected something maybe more akin to what we saw in alien the original screenplay right when that was more of a hive structure versus a derelict ship or like a pyramid structure um, I did think it was strange, like, when specifically seeing this hive, I did think it was strange that, like, maybe I just misinterpreted what I was seeing, but based on the illustration of the hive, I was under the impression that it looked like the xenomorphs also built the external part of the hive that we see in the panel, and I was like, I don't remember them doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a little too structural, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, you'd, just you'd, a bit. You'd imagine it would look more like the inside of their hives. I'm not taking shots, just to be clear, at Mark A. Nelson's artwork. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, the artwork all looks is fine. Great. Yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with the artwork itself. It's just conceptually, it's not how we now know xenomorphs to act. Right. But then again. On the other hand, this was also made before all that stuff that established them as working differently than that. You right. Know? But I will say with the cliffs and the rocks and the a lot of sand, 
and the green, you know, sun plant life mm-hmm. and this big dome structure, I am kind of getting Prometheus vibes, right? <laughs> for like, sure, yes. There's uh, specifically, similarities for sure. Uh, specifically, I was getting uh, Prometheus like the later comic book arcs. Sure. Prometheus vibes. Yeah, I'll give you that. Although I feel like that planet had a lot of stuff going on that they kind of flew over to find the um the row of domes, right? The row of pyramids yeah. for better lack yeah. of a better word. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting, you know. And yeah, and then they march the Marines inside this this hive. And we do see on these internal panels, we do see the kind of rigid structure start to give way to more biological looking like mm-hmm. nest stuff. But um that's kind of overshadowed by the weird dragon creatures attacking all of Massey's men, which is just very fucking strange. It's just yeah, strange. It, it's it's real weird. It's yeah. it's a it's a bizarre thing to suddenly have show up in an alien comic. Again, this is like right at the beginning of the aliens expanded universe. Right. So it hadn't really been established that like other alien species aren't really a thing. So to suddenly just have them show up out of nowhere and they only happen or they only come up that one time for like right. three panels or whatever and then we never see him again it's just like a weird thing to just suddenly drop in because as the franchise goes on it becomes the type of franchise where that kind of thing doesn't, doesn't really happen, happen. right do you think but, these are arcturians <laughs> i hope not <laughs> we're gonna figure out what arcturians are one of these days one um, of these days sure i think my issue with them is that they're they're so fucking generic looking right like they do look yeah, like they look like they're, wind drake off of like a magic the gathering card yeah they're just like uh, like uh listeners crew imagine if you will a person with green skin and then claws and then they have big wings right. they're just real bland looking and they're tail. not they're really that in- uh, yes they i forgot they do have a tail yeah but they're just not really that interesting they're just kind of give me a generic l- flying lizard monster you know <laughs> Right. So, so meanwhile, the Marines have gone into the hive and have mm-hmm. encountered some ovomorphs, but they are not hatching, right? They're like, why are they we sure? They're aren't. literally asking, like, whatever's inside this egg is not attacking. Why are we still alive? Meanwhile, mm-hmm. the mercenaries who have survived the dragon attack have also gone inside the hive to seek shelter, I guess. Yep. And uh, they are also encounter some ovomorphs and are immediately attacked by both ovomorphs and xenomorphs. Uh, yeah, and yeah. they, uh, it, I don't know if we actually see all of them get killed, but I'm pretty sure none of them come back. So right, I do think they all get killed. Um, spoiler alert. For, yeah, but they're and, blowing xenos uh, away. Meanwhile, oh, back yeah. on the ship. Yeah, uh, uh, we cut back to the ship. And uh, Massey has set a timer to blow up the lander that all the people on the surface landed on. Right. And while he's setting that up, uh, Newt comes out of the shadows and points a big gun at him and tells him to stick him the fuck up. Yes. She has found the firing mechanism for her gun in Captain Stevens' room. Mm-hmm. Um, as she Luckily, is... he kept all of them as opposed to yes. getting rid of them. So As she is talking more about how she has to... Forget Butler, forget every good thing. Aliens don't need love. You know, yeah. she's just like, be the be the Zeno, right? And, uh, yeah, she's saying that in order to basically psych herself up to shoot Massey. Right. Unfortunately, uh, despite her best effort, she still has a soul and is not able to shoot him before Massey attacks her. Right. And even uh, though, knocks her to the ground. Oh, go ahead. Even though Massey's holding Hicks, like, a gun to Hicks's chin, Right. Yeah, Massey's good, man. He's real good. He's like, I could do this. But, uh, I could shoot him. I could shoot him. You can't shoot me. I can shoot you. 
Yep, he yeah. uh, Newt tries to get the drop on him, and instead uh, Massey jumps Newt and tackles her to the ground and starts slapping her around and calling her a stupid bitch and talking about how, uh, I believe the line is, Christ, you remind me of my wife, yes. I believe is how he, because he's talking about like how useless and pointless and worthless she is. Yeah, dude, just like this dude is Patrick Bateman. He's like, I don't need weapons. Yeah. I could open your throat with my fingers. You're not, but you're not worth the effort. You're nothing, a distraction. Christ, you and remind me suddenly, of my wife. There's the line. Love it. And then suddenly uh, Hicks intervenes, uh, knocking Massey over. And then after a brief fight, uh, Newt finally works up the nerve to shoot Massey. Right. And then as he collapses, uh, she shoots him in the fucking head and he dies. Right. She pops him in the shoulder. And he's like, you don't scare me. You don't even have the strength to, and then pop right in the head. Again, she was, you know, her whole internal monologue where she's like, I'm not like the alien. The alien would have attacked. What's wrong with me? And then like. And then she does it. And that's, but it's, it's interesting. She has this twist. She says, I wasn't like the alien. Nothing truly human could stand such emptiness. I thought of Butler. I thought of our love. And then she kills him because Like, it's an interesting moment. She's like, I'm human, and I was able to stop this evil guy because I'm, because I have love for somebody else. Yeah, like, I, like, xenomorphs are able to do these things because they have nothing. I am able to do these things because I am the opposite of them and I have something. And I feel like that is Ripley, right? It kind of is. Yeah. Like, that's, that's what makes Ripley Ripley. And I feel like this is Newt, like learning, like understanding mm-hmm. finally. But there's nothing they can do. They can't stop the timer, which is going to blow up the uh, return shuttle, I think, or the transport. Yeah. Fortunately, the Marines were able to get to the transport and get the weapons on it before the timer blew up. Right. It does still blow up, though. It does and, blow up. And, um, while they're down there, there's an interesting scene uh, building on what you mentioned earlier about the oval sure. morphs, where uh, Hicks and Newt get on the radio and they're talking to Butler and the rest of the Marines that are still alive. Yeah. And Butler, who I guess is like the leader of the group down there, Seems to um, be. talks about talks about how he's going to be going back into the yeah. hive for reasons that he either cannot or will not explain. <laughs> Yeah, he, all the Marines, they're going in to save the mercenaries, right? And, and he, like, doesn't get why, yeah. isn't isn't able to explain why he's doing this, but he is. Even Hicks, even as, like, as Newt's trying to, like, you know, she's begging him not to go back. Hicks says, you're wasting time, forget them, they were dead before the mission began. Yeah. And Butler's like, I, I can't explain it, we have to go back, I love you, Newt. Um, and go back, they do, right? Yeah, and they go in. And uh, while they go in, um, after that conversation, Newt and Hicks decide that what they're going to do is, like, the ship is loaded up with a bunch of nukes, yes. and that's what they were going to use to destroy the hive. But the Benedict's uh, lander is, you know, the Benedict shuttle is gone. Right. So what they're going to do is they're going to take all the nukes they currently have and put them on the shuttle for Massey's ship and then use that to take the nukes down, set them up, scoop up all the Marines, and then come back and fly away on the Benedict. Yeah. Which, fair enough, the good idea. Good plan. Worked out well in Out of the Shadows. So, Mm -hmm. similar plan. I guess. And so, uh, like you said, all the Marines head into the back into the hive or yeah, back into the hive to uh, presumably rescue the mercenaries. And uh, while they do, unfortunately, Butler gets scooped up by a xenomorph and uh, ripped in half. (laughs) Yes, he does. This is a fun firefight, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's it's a firefight. There's not a whole lot. It certainly is. Yeah. Not a whole lot to say about it. Well, Are, there's the, one thing to say about it. Is it the head flying around, the severed head? It certainly is. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's a good fighter firefight, right? But the Marines are getting some of these. Um, looks like they are getting some of these mercenaries out, and it is right as they're at the uh, entrance to this hive as the shuttle is landing. 
that... yeah like butler is like standing back like you know i'll cover you guys you guys go and i'll catch up and he pulls out his gun and turns around and there's a big xenomorph standing there and then it picks him up and just rips him in half right he gets aliened which is when the alien grabs you and rips you in half like across the waist and then throws one half to each side that is correct yeah. yes unfortunately uh there's a twist and neil would you care to explain what that twist is yeah somehow uh butler is still alive and the reason he's still alive is because he's a goddamn robot to quote um somebody from alien <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't Parker, yeah, right? I don't remember who it was. I don't remember. But yeah, yeah. Uh, turns out Butler is a synth, and um, Newt uh, finds this out because earlier on in the comic, they had mentioned that they have little viewfinder screens that let them like see what's going on on the surface. So she sees Butler gets ripped in half, yeah. freaks the fuck out, and then she sees him start to like ooze like, white and she freaks out even more yes and uh in an attempt to calm newt down hicks explains that um all of the marines are synths all of them and newt hicks and stevens were the only humans on board this entire ship yeah. and i should say he uh, he says this in an attempt to calm her down and uh newt takes it well i'll phrase it that way <laughs> First of all, it was a Parker quote, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, he, he describes these synths, these synthetics, these uh, artificial persons, right? Mm -hmm. As, right. Um, I mean, they're combat robots, right? And they're like a new line of them who can like eat and socialize and they have all of this programming to make them seem much more human so they fit in with, I guess, yep. other human troops better, right? Mm-hmm. These are like David level, right? Yeah, they're pretty much because like turns out they're so good at like socializing with humans and each right. other that uh, they didn't know they were synths. Yes. Like all of them thought they were humans and yeah. like Hicks and Stevens were like, you know, it'll be easier to like keep them friends with each other and keep them training and like make sure they stick to everything. Yeah. If we just let them think that <laughs> right but this explains a few things right they can eat which explains why they had 104 pounds of that raspberry shit on the mm -hmm. ship but it also explains why it doesn't matter that much that they got rid of 104 pounds of that raspberry shit right mm -hmm. like it was there because they eat but also they don't really need it probably so it's okay yeah. that he jettisoned food. So that clears up uh, something from issue three, I believe. I, I don't remember what issue it was, but from earlier in the comic, yes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was issue three. But the uh, insane thing here is that Newt had sex with a synthetic. She sure did. Yeah. Not only did Newt have sex with a synthetic, but do you remember in issue three or four um, when one of the Marines gets murdered by Stevens? Sure. And then uh, blasted yes. out of an airlock. Remember how when that Marine got killed, he bled? Who was that guy? I don't I don't remember him bleeding. I believe you. But this but this would explain why Stevens got rid of the body so as not to tip everybody off that they were synthetics. That's true. I I just I I mean, maybe I'm misremembering it, but I thought that guy's blood was red, but maybe they didn't show it or maybe it was just like accidentally miscolored or something but like i thought that guy had red blood <laughs> sure i'm gonna open issue four and see if uh if it's in there but also remember that might have been a weird thing when they did the color versions of this because it was a black and white book originally so that wouldn't That's true that wouldn't have been a spoiler if um that is true if it happened, but I am reading the color versions yeah. now as our, and so, know. yeah, maybe it was accidentally miscolored because they saw someone bleeding or maybe it was purposely miscolored as to not spoil the surprise from later. Yeah. Was that issue three? No, nope. there's definitely red blood. Uh, I see yeah, it. I, I, I thought so. Gunshot. There is some red blood there. It's not a lot. Yeah. Because um, like, maybe I'm misremembering it, but like when that, when he got stabbed in the neck with the pipe, like the panel where we see the hand pull the pipe out, I thought there was red on the end of it. 
Yeah, that's but just, maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna chalk that up to a weird coloring decision on these on these recolored versions. Uh, but anyway, that's not even well. It might be the biggest twist of the comic, but that's not the only twist that happens no. in this issue. There's about to be another one. There sure is. Um, they are, I believe they get down to the hive and bring the Marines back. Yes, they scoop up all this. I think there's three survivors and they're all synthetics. It doesn't look like any of the mercs made it out. And yeah, they're all synthetics. And I do remember that they bring along the top half of Butler with them. Right. He's one of them. So there's two and a half synthetics. <laughs> And they get back to the Benedict, and then, uh, unfortunately, the Benedict is, or actually, no. no, no, no. It, so it they could, get it back. It be the Benedict. It has to be. It has to be the shuttle, the lander yes. on the planet. Yeah. They're on. They're on the planet, and they're all back at the lander. And uh, Newt's like, "We got to leave. Let's get out of here. We have to launch." And Hicks is like, "No, not until I set the nukes." But suddenly, kathump is the noise. This uh, lander yep. is getting swarmed on the outside. By yeah, there's just xenomorphs all over, clinging yes. all over the place nonstop. Uh, one of them even starts breaking through the hole and like sticks his face through it. Yeah, and then um, they're stopped by, according to my notes, as I even wrote down, they're stopped by dot 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 something I genuinely did not see coming. <laughs> Yeah, it turns out there is a big old space jockey in a big old space suit holding what looks to be, I don't know, two big laser guns or something. something. Anyway, he used it to kill all of the xenomorphs that yes. were on the ship. You you heard us correctly, folks. Big old space jockey in a big old space suit. Mm -hmm. um, elephant trunk nose, right? Cthulhu, yep. Cthulhu tentacles also. Right, squid like yep, tentacles, like, under, like you know, the trunk comes out where the nose is and kind of like curves down, and then in that space between like where the mouth would be and where the trunk is, there's a bunch of little tentacles coming out. Yeah, and then he has like sideways, like horizontal oval eyes that have cross pupils on them, yes. which I thought was pretty neat. That's a fun little detail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the space jockey. This is the first like version of a living space jockey uh in aliens media right we will definitely see others but this is the first time they've shown we will yes. this is what the engineer was before it was the engineer this is a living mm -hmm. version of what was on the derelict in alien um this was uh thought up by mark verheiden and mark a nelson based on just that creature from alien right Mm -hmm. like the space jockey as let's, it were. let's make this thing alive you know um oh, yeah. that's also the end of issue five hell of yeah a that is how it ends that's how it fucking ends you imagine seeing that in 1988 and then um <laughs> having to wait two months right Boy, yeah, smokes. Yeah, yeah but luckily though we don't have to no i want to talk about a few things on issue five first if you don't mind you got it um the prometheus parallels obviously in the the environment of the planet and then of course the um arrival of a space jockey uh all being very directly tied to the xenomorph right mm -hmm. it's interesting it's fun to see and like this would be i could see so we, we all know i've said it many times on the show i don't want answers to everything right i just don't i want mystery yeah. i don't want to know where the xenomorph sure. came from but this is the kind of stuff in like if like that i would have been fucking hyped for if I was reading these yeah. in 88, first of all, I would have been three. So that's way too young to understand these things, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. But the excitement of like, I'm going to see where the Xeno, like the Xenomorph home planet and holy shit, that's the monster from the movie and it's alive. Like those kinds of surprises. I, I yeah, really get into. Like, it connects stuff, but it doesn't really explain anything. We don't, right. we're like, like this space Jackie showing up, that doesn't give us any answers to anything no. other than it tells us that the space jockeys as a race, like as a species sure. are not extinct. That's the only thing this tells us. Yes. You know? Yeah. And they're fucking weird looking, but also sort of look exactly <laughs> like you would think they would look based on that fossilized one. Yeah. And it gives you more things to think about and theorize about, right? It's not the kind of thing mm -hmm. that you'd, it doesn't answer all the questions for you, but it, it's the kind of thing you would then talk to your buddy about, like, what does this mean? This would be, this would become like playground lore 
Like, did you hear there's a comic book and you can see where the alien came from? Like, <laughs> yeah. that would be like the, t- that would be, this is probably the kind of conversations my brother and his friends were having when they were discovering this <laughs> stuff. Honestly, those are probably, yeah, probably the things that he said to me, right? Like, <laughs> check this out in the comic book. You can see the, this is the space jockey. And I don't think he called it that. I think they were just calling it the, the pilot or the, the yeah. elephant alien or whatever the fuck back then. Or right. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I, I got a little excited reading this issue. I was like, oh, this is fun. This would have been a hell of a uh, there hell were, of an issue back in the day. You know, there were a lot of parts of this comic or of this specific issue, rather, I should yeah. say, that I really liked. I I don't know why I got such a thrill out of when Newt actually killed Massey. I thought that was a really I, was I guess I, I I guess it was just the fact that like, you know, of course we knew he was going to die, but the fact that they decided to have Newt be the one that did it, I thought was pr- because like it could have right. easily just been Hicks because that's literally his job. Sure. But instead they had it be Newt, which I thought was a nice touch. Yeah. Um, that panel of the xenomorph head sticking out through the hole in the hole of the lander i really liked yeah that was great um the other thing i want to touch on from this issue is the reveal of all of the soldiers being synthetics right yeah Mm, alien icarus anybody but yeah we we literally just spent like almost a month talking right. about exactly that and i feel like there was definitely a time covering that where i was like what a good idea to just send synthetics into like an alien planet to like get whatever you need because synthetics aliens tend to ignore synthetics that was the exact plan from this right they were the mm-hmm. marines were like we're going to send synthetics in because they will they will not be read as hostile by the xenomorphs we know that much it's a fascinating plan and and I like the way that like the mystery sort of unfolds where you're like why aren't the xenomorphs attacking the unarmed marines but now they're attacking the armed you know the mercenaries, mercenaries yeah. and then it all makes sense you're like of course yeah. they're, they're fucking robots I don't know it's fun <laughs> it's a fun twist I like I like that as a story beat of like no 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 these are all these are all robot boys yeah see what's great about it is that we liked it last time it happened in a comic yes. so of course we're going to like it when it happens again in this right. one it's fun to know? see and it happened this it happened the first time in the comic yeah, too like that's true that's this true. is the first time so it's a cool idea but um i'm ready to jump into issue six now if you are all right uh sure um issue six starts off with newt uh being given some kind of psychic vision yes by this space jockey and it lasts for like two or three pages, but all of the information that uh, it gives her can be summed up in the two word phrase space jockey, because <laughs> um, the entirety yes. of the vision that she gets is literally just an explanation of what happened in Alien. Right. Or in a, or in, well, in, or rather, what happened to the space jockeys in Alien? I should say that, but also what happened to her parents in Aliens? She also sees that's yeah. also true. Yes, right. I did forget about that. That's a good point. So we learn that I mean the information that we all kind of know that this juggernaut was on a mission and it crashed right with all mm-hmm. these alien eggs, and they all survived, but obviously one got loose and got onto the space jockey. We also learn, we also see Newt like watching her parents go into the derelict ship from their wildcat, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what they call the ships? I know the people are wildcatters, right? Um, they might be crawlers. Crawler, that's what it is. It's crawler. So we see the crawler going in and we see uh, her parents inside. We see them encounter the fossilized space jockey and get the face hugger and everything and 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 for newt seeing all this stuff seeing her parents die again seeing it, the alien it's all very traumatic for her but this mm-hmm. is a vision being given to her by presumably by the space jockey like through psychic yeah. you know communication and this is must have been what i was thinking about all these times where i was like i think nuke's got a psychic thing going on i'm not sure if she does uh she clearly she does and it's perhaps not her power. Perhaps she's just susceptible to the psychic abilities of other creatures in this comic book series. 
But, well, um, she also she gets an or she has another psychic vision later on in this right. issue. She does. But I believe that one is also projected into her brain by right. this space jockey. So So perhaps she's just like an empath and she's just sensitive to these yeah. the psychic output of others. But I'm glad to finally like have an answer and not have been a total fool because I would have been embarrassed if I was like, I'm pretty sure Newt's got psychic shit going on in this comic, and then there just was none. Well, right. I mean, she does have psychic shit going on. You were correct. It's just it wasn't her that was the right. one being the psychic is all. Right. Anyway, through this vision, she learns that this space jockey was friends with the other space jockey. And mm-hmm. he's killing Xenomorphs for revenge. Right. That's her interpretation. Yep. Um, it is implied. Well, or rather, I inferred that sure. this space jockey was one of the ones that was on the juggernaut that crashed on 426. Oh, interesting. Maybe that wasn't the implication, but that's how I inferred that information. Right. And it was basically like he was friends with the captain. He saw that thing kill it, and so he's like, I am going to kill every single one of these things. Could be. I feel like if that were the case, he would have wiped out all the eggs, though. But Maybe. Maybe he didn't know about it. Maybe he only saw the one bust out of the captain right maybe he wasn't aware yeah or maybe he wasn't there at all Um, yeah who knows maybe he wasn't yeah i mean like i said i'm not saying that's the that is not what necessarily what information the comic itself gets that's just how i interpreted what this thing says right that's all but yeah it's in any case they were bros right correct uh and it's like saying all this stuff about just how hopeless she is and how the only Mm -hmm. universal truth is evil and she's just having a rough fucking time yep we are going to cut back to earth now we sure do we cut back to specifically uh the doctor dr arona i believe his name is yes yeah who and he is he he was part of he was overseeing the xenomorph experiment on the guy from the junket right Yep. Yes. Lakowski. Lakowski. There it is. And uh, we cut back to him and he's basically locked in his office giving his quote final report. Right. And his final report is effectively shit's fucked dog. Yeah. Bad times at uh, Earth High. Right. So uh, turns out that queen that was uh, birthed on Earth. Sure. Um, uh, It laid a bunch of eggs, and uh, when those eggs hatched, uh, there were they were all also queens. Yeah, a lot of other queens. <laughs> yes. And so there were a whole bunch of queens, and uh, he thought they were fine at first because he's like, oh, like, you know, we're not sure how long they gestate, but based on the size, it'll probably take a while. Right. But uh, turns out, no, uh, though, I believe the way he described it is something to the effect of, they take however long to gestate they need to in the environment yes. they're in. So all of them are almost immediately ready to lay eggs right. themselves. Oh, there's more to that because um, uh, he also talks about how the alien queen is able to communicate in some subconscious fashion, right? His direct words. And, and, and the people around it interpret them as having a strange dream. Right. <laughs> And that the, he says the dreams were a lure. So that was what was going on with that religious cult last yeah. last couple of issues. That's why those people were drawn to where the queen was. So I, I think the idea here is that uh, the gestation period lasts as long as it needs to. With plenty of hosts around, it's almost instantaneous, right? They mature very yeah. quickly and start laying eggs. Because this yeah, queen they... has been luring so many people in. With these, yeah, the, the implication yeah. is that queens mature faster the more hosts are around. Right. So that's why queens have like an ability to like psychically summon people yes. because it lets them gestate and mature faster. It's also why everyone was having these weird ass nightmares about mm-hmm. monsters coming out of the TV and stuff. Yep. Fascinating. Uh, I like it. I don't think I've, we've seen anything in the movies that would contradict that idea, right? Like... We have seen queens mature very quickly, depending Mm -hmm. on the environment, right? But we haven't really seen, like, people get lured or attracted to where a queen is yet. We haven't seen that. To my knowledge. But we also haven't seen a queen on a, in a heavily populated planet, with the exception of Alien versus Predator, the movie. Also true. Also true. But it's a fascinating idea. 
uh, long story short, uh, turns out we see due to a montage that um, there have been xenomorphs uh, already actively in the middle of spreading all over the world, right. which I would describe as not ideal. Yeah, there's like a guy on an airplane. It looks like there's a woman on the beach. And an yeah, old there's lady. a babe in a bikini. Yep. Yes. It's, well, it's a comic book. You got to have a bikini babe. That's right. There's an older woman, an elder woman getting off of a train or some kind of transport. Next panels is chest bursters like busting out of the dude on the plane. The woman yep. on the beach like bleeding out of her mouth because it's happening to her and the old lady also. So shit's spreading like crazy. Yeah. They call it a spore, right? The spore keeps yep. spreading. And uh, before long, it's, again, maybe not it's implied, but I inferred that it only takes like a few weeks yeah, until, so until society has completely collapsed and like right. most of humanity is dead. We see the Marines like spread out patrolling people. They're hurting people towards testing centers. Like they've set up testing centers already. Like, uh, you know, you know, um, feels a little real life. <laughs> Yeah, dude, uh, you know, tying it into a relevant culture that's going on right now. It's sure. a lot like it's a lot like the initial setting of The Last of Us, if anyone has played or watched that. There you go. Did they do anything like this in Alien Covenant Origins? I don't think so. I don't think so, no. <laughs> because yeah. the xenomorphs weren't there yet, you know. Right. But uh but yeah, he's basically like I said, he's sending out this final report talking about how society is collapsed. It's basically martial law. Right. All of the corporations are saving are like, themselves. Yep. They're like buying up and shooting out all of the last transports on the planet to like get their CEOs off planet and yes. all that. And um, just as he's wrapping up this report, um, a xenomorph breaks into his like bunker that he's in and right. he pulls out a gun and shoots himself rather than letting the xenomorph get him. Hell of a final words, too. He says, I've never actually fired one of these. I feel rather foolish. Bang. Oh, also, I forgot. Um, he also I, there was some something else he talked about in this message that sure. I forgot to mention earlier. Yeah. Um, he also talks about how they have an entire mountain filled to the brim with nukes that they're right. going to set off to try to destroy all the xenomorphs. Sure, right? Because he's like this. He's like the the xenomorphs are a cancer, and we yeah. use radiation to kill cancer. So we're using nukes to kill xenomorphs. Just a direct that's, comparison. That's the logic, yes. Right. Like, not, it, it is such a direct comparison that in the message, he literally says, I remember when I was young, my mom was dying of cancer, right. and, they gave, and they used chemo to try to stop it. We're doing literally exactly the same thing right now. Right. But also, we're going to bomb the fuck out of them, which is going to do most of the killing, right? The bomb yeah. part. And then the radiation will hopefully take care of the rest. It's, you know, I mean, the, the idea of them being a disease from space, right? A cancer that spreads. That's not a new idea. It certainly isn't. But I, I do like, like, it's a, the thematic comparison to chemotherapy is interesting, right? That's yeah. good. I mean, <laughs> it feels like good writing to me. Yeah, like like that's the kind of thing where like I I was like, oh, okay, they're gonna use nukes because they're just like really powerful and kill stuff. And then the dude's like, you know, my mom had cancer and we gave her chemo, and I was like, okay, now I can see. All right, now I'm getting you a right. book. Yeah. Um. Turns out, Hicks and Newt were watching this final message from this guy. Right. Yeah, I don't know if it was like live on a tape delay or if it was a recording, but yeah, like we cut to them like on the like, you know, still on the lander and they're just like watching all of this happen on a monitor. Yeah. And uh Hicks is having his, you know, damn you, you blew it up Planet of the Apes mm -hmm. moment, right? Mhm. Mm While Newt's just like uh we have to go back. And he's like, no. And she's like, uh, yeah. And he's like, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, her plan is let's bring this big space jockey guy back and he'll help us kill them all. <laughs> right. Mm. Like he'll, that is literally the plan. She's like, let's up. get his help. I already know he wants to kill all the xenomorphs and there's a whole bunch there. And so, uh, Newt and the top half of Butler and uh, Hicks uh, pile funny. up on 
<laughs> pile onto the lander, fly up to the Benedict, and then the Benedict, and uh, turns out the space jockey arrived in a juggernaut of his own. Sure. And so those two ships zip off back to Earth. Right. Uh, as the, Yeah. Did you mention that the nukes blow up the hive? Uh, I forgot to, but yes, uh, while they're flying away, Hicks activates the nukes and the hive gets destroyed. Kapowy, right? That's not the sound effect. I, That's what a, the sound effect I would have written in if this were my comic book. <laughs> Kapowy. I don't remember how or even if the comic does depict how Hicks and Newt manage to tell the jockey that this is their plan but somehow the jockey also knows this is what they're doing because right. when they fly off he like goes with them sure like, it, like it, i said he's driving his own car but you get the point right not only does it not show it's only a few pages later like we see we see the lander go up back up to the benedict and then we just see inside the benedict for a couple pages and it's when they're approaching earth that we see the juggernaut was with them my and when they say sure we've got sir you know whoever's on earth says sir there's two ships approaching uh one of them is the benedict yeah uh my assumption is newt just thought it at him that's fair that's right? fair or maybe he's more like the engineers than uh we know and he was like yeah i'm headed there anyway to destroy it that was the original <laughs> mission right because maybe jesus was one of me and you all killed him <laughs> um imagine, also just, sorry imagine go ahead, go ahead. jesus was one of these engineers like <laughs> one of these space jockeys <laughs> uh gross well uh you know i guess they'd have to start uh changing some art here and there then that's why he's always depicted with a beard right ah nice yeah. nice I see yeah man there. makes sense um the only other thing of note that happens right here is that on the way back, uh, Newt and Butler uh, make up and are friends or dating or whatever again. Yeah, love is love. Uh, because there was a period there where uh, Newt was really mad. And then he's like, look, I was literally like, I literally didn't know what I was doing because it was right. how I was programmed. And then she was basically like hands on hips. <sighs> fine and then they like hug again and now yeah. they're cool again which is the only thing he can still do because he's missing his half of his body yeah, yeah it is much. it is nice that they make up i mean he's he basically says because she's like i need to know if it was real and he's like uh when that thing tore into me i remember only thinking about how much i loved you and then i saw what was left and i suddenly knew <laughs> like Oh, I'm a synthetic fuck. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where I have to assume that it was as real as it could be for yeah. him being a, a synth because it's like he wasn't programmed to be in love with Newt, you right. know? I don't think they were aware. I think they were kind of like um, the replicants in Blade Runner. They weren't really aware that they were synthetics right yeah uh hicks mentions like when butler gets ripped in half and yeah. like she finds out their sense hicks is like look it was just easier if they didn't even know so yeah right. butler wasn't even aware he was a synth until he got ripped in half and went row -ro. yeah pretty tragic and it's yeah. you're starting early on with this weird treatment of synthetics in this alien universe like it makes sense when they're so close to human Right. I mean, that's something mm -hmm. that's been discussed for decades in science fiction. Yeah, for sure. Just a matter of time before it uh, becomes reality. Uh, <laughs> what with this weird um, being chatbot and whatnot, right? <laughs> yeah, you you even mentioned earlier you were using Bing, and I was going to make some kind of reference to their, like, AI search function, but I decided to let it go. Right. I'm not using that. I'm just using the, the search bar. I'm not, like... <laughs> talking to I, I, you know that chat bot that's like talking people into, or trying to talk people into leaving their spouses or whatever the fuck is going <laughs> yeah, on or right whatever now. it was yeah God whatever it, it was yeah jesus these, but uh it's more important than ever to read these alien books people that's what i'm saying that is cor that is correct yeah. uh speaking of which um uh they make it to earth and have a little bit of trouble landing but manage to land without much of an issue right and uh when hicks uh threatens the commanding officer that meets him on the landing pad uh they find out that uh because you know the whole reason they're here is because they're like you don't have to set off the nukes we have someone right. that can do something about the xenomorphs without having to blow everything up and um uh, 
the human in charge basically says that he wants right like they've decided they want the nukes to go off for the reasoning of if we can't have it no one can effectively yeah it's they're literally like he's literally like no no we have to like whoever wants to blow up the planet is right to do it uh earth's been on the brink of destruction for decades there's no discipline no order he's like we're just gonna nuke it it's gonna give us a clean slate we're gonna come back here in a few years when it's all over and we're gonna terraform the earth into something good again we're just gonna wipe it out right now we're hitting the reset button yeah, the, the basically their plan is uh, they send all of their like CEOs and politicians and stuff off planet. Then they're going to blow up the planet. And then all, all of those smart people and all those big wigs and all those business guys are going to come back to Earth and terraform it like to resemble how they want the planet to be. Basically, right. just Walmart's as far and, as the eye can uh, see. And Hicks gets real pissed off, but before he's able to do anything, uh, they get interrupted by a bunch of Xenomorphs breaking sure. through containment and attacking them. And yes. uh, during the confusion, Hicks and Newt manage to escape with the top half of Butler in tow. Thank God. Um, I do want to say this place is called the Galveston, right? The guy says "Yeah, the creatures have yes. breached the Galveston security line. Um, the planet i believe in uh out of the shadows and sea of sorrows was or the ship was it the ship was called new galveston it it was um i believe it was the colony the colony the new galveston the colony on the planet where they were mining the trimonite or whatever right that was it might have been the plant it might have been the planet, but like my point is, it was not the name of the ship. It was like something, it was either the planet or something on the planet was called New Galveston, yes. So I wonder if like that was an intentional reference. Yeah, New Galveston, LV178, according to, again, our favorite website, the AVP fandom, Xenopedia. Um, Love the Xenopedia, baby. Not a paid ad. Yeah, Sea of Sorrows. Yeah, New Galveston was is what they're calling the planet. I'm wondering if that was a reference to this right like i wonder if that Maybe, book was treating be. this as canon somehow i don't think it, i don't think that's the case but it's interesting i mean just a little nod maybe i just wanted to touch on that because i remembered the name galveston from something else we'd seen so yeah as the three of them leave newt gets another like psychic projection message from the jockey and that message is effectively <laughs> More or less, yeah. Basically, uh, the jockey is like, you know, she, the message she gets is that the jockey had a lot of revenge for killing the xenomorphs, but um, when he showed up and saw Earth, he immediately uh, stopped caring about the xenomorphs, and he's like, "Oh, this planet's gonna become jockey territory now, baby. I'm yeah. just gonna sit back and I'm gonna wait." And I'm just going to let them do what they do and interfere when the time is right for me. And right. she's like, "Uh oh, no, don't do that. But um, since they're on an automated ship before she can do anything about it, the ship just blasts off into space. Yeah. It, the desire to conquer it no longer cared about the aliens. Interest had shifted. The soldiers assumed they would return one day and terraform the earth for themselves. It would watch. It would be waiting for them. It just yeah. wanted me to know. Wild mm-hmm. dude. Weird. Yeah. Just weird. The line it wanted me to know is the one that really got me because it's like the what that means is there there, there was literally no reason for him to say this to her. Right. He said it literally just to be a dick because right. he knew they were about to blast off and like be away from him so they couldn't do anything yeah. about it. So he's like, since you can't stop me check this shit out yeah or again maybe because she's the only one who can understand the messages he's sending out right and he knows that she can so it's fascinating um really nice panel with all these cargo ships taking off and these xenomorphs sort of going at it i love the colors on that panel you know Mm -hmm. yeah we should comment it's rainy right super moody Sure is like as they're trying to as they're landing and then also trying to like make their escape again right really liked this this these final few pages i guess we've got one more 
right after the space jockey has said his business yeah that's not literally the last thing that happens like the cargo ship like i said they're on like an automated cargo ship that has like a destination already pre-programmed in and so she gets this message right before it blasts away and we don't we're not told where specifically the ship is going it's just somewhere in deep space and like we see the ship just drifting towards its destination and hicks is sitting in the captain's seat just kind of like stewing to himself yeah and butler and newt are like in butler's bedroom just kind of like chilling and hanging out and the two groups of them hicks and newton butler are kind of just like think monologuing to themselves while the ship is drifting. And that's just how the comic ends. What's being narrated by Newt, she says, fix Hicks, fix Christ. (laughs) I wasn't going to say anything. (laughs) Hicks finally has his revenge, but he found no satisfaction in it. When it began, he blamed his misery on the aliens. Now all he could blame was himself. Real self-destructive streak for this man, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, Newt comments that she isn't alone anymore, and maybe that's all that she's ever really needed. And while she's saying that, she's looking out the window, and Butler's, like, half kind of trying to grab her, half ki- kind of trying to, like, grab ass her, you know? He's just <laughs> kind of, like, reaching out to her and generically grabbing her. They're sort of going... she's just, like, thinking to herself out the window. <laughs> it look, looks to me like they're sort of going for each other's hands. It's um sweet enough, I guess. Yeah. It's a very abrupt ending, but I do love the way this the ba- the space background on this page is colored with these purple like sw- swooshes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Very cool looking book. The colored version is very nice also. I will agree with you. It is kind of a sudden end. And I think part of the reason why it felt so sudden to me right. is because the this, this issue, and I guess kind of you could say this comic, doesn't really feel like there's much of like a big climax to right. it. There's not like and a big fight. And that's the reason why... Yeah, and that's the reason I think that's the reason why it felt like it just kind of suddenly ended because it's not like some big climactic thing happened and then we were expecting it to end right after that because yeah. nothing like that really happened. Stuff just kind of went at the normal pace the rest of the comic was at. You know? Sure. There was a ticking clock, right? There was. Just yes. like there was at the end but of Alien was... and Aliens. I'm not talking about the the timer on the um you know, on the planet I'm talking about here, where they're trying to get like to the automated uh, cargo carriers before the planet blows up because they do nuke the planet, right? They sure do. Those nukes do go off. (laughs) Hicks and Newt and Butler do barely escape from that as do all the other cargo ships. But it's an easy thing to miss because like, we just know that that's going to happen and everyone's evacuating. And then during the weird space jockey monologue, is when the explosion happened, right? Yeah, that's the reason I forgot to mention it during that part of the recap. Right. Because despite them uh, setting off a a mountain filled with nuclear bombs, that's not the important thing. Like, that's not the focal point and the important part of what's going on in the comic at that time. (laughs) Sure. And that's what I'm getting at. Like, I didn't really put together that there was a, a ticking clock either. Uh, yeah. Great way to raise tension, ticking clock, works uh, incredibly in both Alien and Aliens to like really ramp up the tension at the end of the movie, you know? Very true. Uh, yeah. Would have loved to see a spin on that here. And it's there, it's just not, you, you just don't care about it. Like, I would have loved to see time ticking down in the corners of the panels yeah. or something, right? I would have loved if, mm-hmm. you know, give us a panel of the explosion before Newt goes into her vision, right? Um, yeah. Show us them giant mushroom clouds or something i'm not sure because mm-hmm. we don't even really yep. get to see that we do see the planet and it's like a blaze in red but we don't see the actual explosion yeah it's a minor gripe i i do i am overall very very pleased by this story yeah well uh which speaking of which since like i mentioned that is the end of the issue let's just get into it uh what are your thoughts on it what are what are your feelings what would you rate it at things like that uh this comic's an absolute banger this is a true true heater of a comic book um we we've talked about some of the things that this thing does in previous episodes like there are these these long like internal monologues and 
stuff that I've compared to Alan Moore or Frank Miller or other comic creators at this time, specifically, who are sort of revolutionizing mm-hmm. the medium in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And I think Ver- Verheiden's doing a good job of, I'll say emulating. I don't know that that's fair, right? But like in issue, was it the beginning of this issue? Yeah, when Newt is having her flashback of seeing the space jockey, seeing her parents go into the juggernaut, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, that and was issue six. She yes. keeps flashing back to I'm six years old and then, you know, I'm an adult and I'm six years old. That felt like Dr. Manhattan's like soliloquy on, <laughs> yeah. on Mars, yes. right, in a yes. lot of ways. That's why I'm going to say he's kind of emulating. But it's very successful in my opinion. Yeah, uh, it's a well written book. It's a well drawn book. Um, the recolored versions are uh, pretty dope, with the exception that they might have given a synthetic red blood on a previous issue, mm-hmm. which is an oversight and also um, an example of why certain things can work in a comic book medium that can't work in other mediums, right? Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I like this. I I don't know that I love it as much as I remembered loving it, but I still really really like it. If that makes sense. I get you. And I'm wondering if um, I'll continue to enjoy this thread as when we in the future revisit some of these other early Aliens comic books, like the next couple of story arcs or something. Again, sometime in the future, not not up next. Right. Yeah, we're not doing them next. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else I have to say about it. Uh, It's good. And if you're an Aliens fan and you haven't read these, you should read them. They're an interesting time capsule of 80s comics right they're an interesting sequel concept for the movie aliens they are what kicked off the dark horse run which is beloved amongst aliens fans if you haven't checked this series out you absolutely should just to have checked it out you know what i mean you don't have to love it but i feel like this is like you should know your history right yeah for sure what about you how do you feel about about this series overall well how should i phrase this There's a lot of things about this comic that I didn't like. Okay. However, by the time I was done reading it, I ended up liking it more than I expected to when I started off. Okay. There's, there's a lot of things, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that I, I I suppose I'm going to go back and, um, retract my previous statement it's not so much that i didn't like them sure. it's more that now in retrospect there's a lot of stuff this comic does that i don't think really works or like represents alien as a franchise okay but again a lot of that can be chalked up to because this is like the first one right this is like how the expanded alien universe like started so a lot of the stuff that i'm comparing it to is stuff that was made after this right but like you know the fact that uh the focus of it was stuff happening on earth yeah which is a planet that we don't really see in the franchise and like the huge focus on like dreams and the huge focus right. on like uh psychic powers sure and the huge focus on religion which is also something that doesn't really come up that often this is an extremely weird time capsule of what the aliens franchise could have been that when they made more it eventually ended up pulling in a different direction. So this feels like kind of a strange outlier, but it does a lot of things, right? Like um, what's his name? Mark a Nelson. Is that his name? Yeah. Um, He draws a fucking phenomenal Xenomorph. He does. The Queens look (laughs) good. The The warriors look good. Yep. Like all the Xenomorphs look great, but it also has the same problem that I have with a lot of other comic books of this era. I have trouble distinguishing the human characters apart from each other. Sure. But the Xenomorphs look great. Most of the art looks great. A lot of my complaints in the earlier issues of this arc ended up not becoming a problem by the time I was done. Same here. Like while I was, while I was reading it, I was like, I don't fucking care about all this like (laughs) religious preacher cult stuff, but then it got tied into the main storyline. And so I was like, Oh, okay. That's why all that stuff is there. Right. You know, (laughs) there was a lot of world building in those first couple of issues. Right. 
And so uh, listeners to the show may remember me being I didn't I don't think I outright said it, but I was kind of mid on the series up to this point. Yeah, no, but like by the thank you by the time (laughs) i was done with these two issues i was like you know what it all kind of tied together in the end ironically enough kind of the opposite of icarus where i thought everything up to the end was great and then the end kind of left me cold a little sure this is the exact opposite of that i was kind of like until i got to the last couple of issues and then everything tied together and i went "Ooh, baby yeah, and that and that series started with a bunch of synthetics going into an alien hive, and this one kind of ended with a bunch of synthetics going into an alien hive. It sure did. Yeah. It, like the parallels are becoming greater the more we talk about them. Perfect but mirrors yeah, of each other. The general gist Perfect of my opinion, mirrors of each other. <laughs> that is correct. Perfect. the The gist of it, as far as my opinion, my overall thoughts. It is good. It is not the best alien comic I've ever read, but it is an interesting way to like, if you're able to put yourself in the headspace of this is where it all began. Like, you know, this is what was supposed to start it off. It is a very interesting idea. It it goes in a lot of interesting directions. And like you said, if you like aliens, definitely read this comic because it is more of that but in an absolutely insane way right this yeah this comic book goes hard yes it does i want to add that i think a lot of my opinion about this thing is coming from nostalgia yes which is something uh to remind the listeners i do not have when i read this comic for or when i read this comic now for the show it's the first time i've ever read it Right. And I've read this before, but I've also read other early Dark Horse stories, you know, as a kid or whatever, or looked at them, looked through them, right? Flipped Mm -hmm. through the the books at the store or when my brother was at his friend's house, right? Mm -hmm. Or when my brother had his comic books out and we were just looking through comic books, you know, we did a lot of that too. So I, yeah, so this era was representative of aliens to me for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. obviously Mm -hmm. as years went on and i started exploring more modern stuff i'll call it i i got less and less of an attachment to the dark horse stuff that i wasn't checking out constantly and more of an attachment to the current things that i was engaged with for sure but it's it's nice to revisit it and and like it's always going to have a spot on my list in terms of like influential alien books right like it just oh i it definitely is that for sure. Right. It might be the most influential one. <laughs> I think so. I mean, as as we've seen, right, there are yeah. a lot of there are a lot of parallels between this and not that Alien Covenant Origins is like a big deal book in the fandom, right? It certainly isn't. <laughs> but gosh, a lot of similarities, right? And I still have a theory, even if this is just the specific example of xenomorphs on earth that we actually got i still Mm -hmm. theorize that that this and that covenant origins book will have an influence on the alien television series that we know is taking place on earth right because that's the thing it's like when you're talking about like i'm you know a story set in the alien universe that takes place on earth there's really only one that I know of that has xenomorphs in it, which the show has already been confirmed to do. There's only one story in the alien franchise that takes place on earth uh, that takes place on a earth that has xenomorphs on it. There's only one. It's this, so right. It's this one. And so even if, the show is not an adaptation of this story. Right. There's no way it can't be at least somewhat influenced by it because this is the only time before they'd ever done that. You know? Right. But I'm predicting cults. I'm predicting psychic mm. shit. I'm predicting a Duncan Fields. I know that's from the Covenant book, but you know what I mean. Like yeah. I'm predicting like weird religious stuff, but I'm probably only predicting that because that's the stuff we've gotten, right? Like It sure is. I will uh, my bl- blow my socks off fx and and don't pull anything from these stories right i mean the only other thing i can think of off the top of my head that's in the alien franchise that even takes place on earth other than like the end of resurrection i guess 
is the flashback stuff in the novelization of isolation. Right. So yeah. give us that. And, Just adapt and isolation. That, and that didn't have any xenomorphs in it at all. That's you know? true. Yeah. So I don't know. This is a, this is a check it out from both of us, right? We're both great in For this. Sure. Check it out. Yes, you know? I agree with that. Yeah. If anything, you got to know your history, right? You got to see. That's right. Got to see where some of this other stuff came from, where it's going, especially in the Dark Horse universe. You know, this and Newt's tale probably the best aliens comics. As far as I know, uh, this comic was canon until it suddenly wasn't. One day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Once they're like, we're gonna do so, Alien Three. Yeah. Um, and well, even the, even after that, it was still canon once they changed the names of the characters. Right. To Wilkes, so. to Wilkes and Billy. And that might. So yeah. you're thinking in, at the end of Alien Resurrection that this is might be the Earth they're returning to all burnt and nuked and undeveloped. Well, that's not what I was saying, but with, I suppose that is a good extrapolation of what I yeah. did say. With a space jockey acting like Uwatu the Watcher, just like looking over it. Yeah. Waiting for Ripley to show he, up. He sure is doing that, isn't he? <laughs> waiting for Ripley to face off with Judge Dredd or whatever the fuck happens. <sighs> that would rule. I would love that so much. <laughs> I mean, there is a Judge Dredd versus Aliens comic. <laughs> right. Doesn't that feature Ripley from resurrection or am i thinking of the terminator alien versus predator versus terminator um that one is that that comic takes place post resurrection but i don't know if ripley 8 is in it okay but the judge dread v aliens comic that has, um, that has ripley 8 in it i don't know when that takes place so i don't know okay all right we'll figure it out we'll get to that shit eventually you know yeah sooner or later yeah 20 or 30 years from now once we've gone through everything <laughs> else yeah pretty much that's oh, how it goes brother there's a lot <laughs> yeah what are we doing next episode kenny um i was just about to say speaking of a lot um yeah. we're go we're hitting is this the first time we've covered a video game it is the first time we covered a video game and i bet yeah. listeners right now cannot guess what it is unless we announced it on an earlier episode which I think we Which did. Which we very well might have. Yeah. We might have said before, but in case we didn't, or hell, even in case we did, um, the next episode is going to be about the uh, 2010 uh, DS game Aliens Infestation. Yes, a uh, fan favorite game. One of those <laughs> one of those hidden gems on the DS didn't get a lot of press. That uh, got good reviews and people like yeah, it it got good reviews. People seem to like it. I don't think it sold super well, and copies of it are kind of expensive for like a 13-year-old DS game. It sure. might have come out in 2011. I don't remember what year it came out, but it's a DS game. It's called uh, Aliens Infestation, and it's basically what if aliens but a Metroidvania is yeah. basically the gist. Very, very similar to a... To a metroidvania style game set on the uss Salako and lv426 i think a lot of the conversation will be about the settings and events right we're not mm -hmm. going to talk a whole lot about like shooting your gun up and down right yeah i mean there's not a whole lot in the way of gameplay you just walk around the 2d plane uh killing xenomorphs and collecting gear to get to the next area where you can collect gear and kill xenomorphs yeah i mean there's not really a whole lot there it's more like the story and the settings and like the vibe of it is really what's more important so yeah so we'll be getting into some of that stuff on the next episode um, but let's get out of here for now. Kenny, where can people find you on the internet if you want them to? My handle on pretty much everything is C-Y-H-O-B-B-E-Z. Pretty much any social media site that I have an account on, you'll be able to find me there, yeah. except for the ones where I purposely used a different username so that people can't find me. So yeah. there. Fuck you, people. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Final Neil and Instagram at Final Neil Retro. I do a show about Mortal Kombat, TV shows, comic books, uh, movies, anything but the games. You can find that at mkpodquest.com or search mkpodquest in your podcast app. Kenny, where can people find this show? Our website is crewexpendable.net. 
Our Instagram handle is at crew expendable pod. Our Twitter handle is at crew expenda pod. And if you want to send us an email, email us at mother at crew expendable dot net. Yeah, we will be back next week to talk about a Nintendo DS game. So dust off your Nintendo DS or 3DS, charge that baby up, get on eBay, spend way too much money on a single mm-hmm. game or find the ROM. Look, I don't care. I, I literally do own a physical like DS cart of it. Yeah. And when I bought it, it was a uh, cart only and it cost me like 65 bucks. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, just get the ROM. Yeah, just get the ROM. It's fine. No one's going to tell. Yes, we we certainly won't. And no one's going to tell on you. Don't worry. We'll be digging into aliens infestation next time on the podcast. Until then, until then, then, Jesus Christ. I This is the third podcast I recorded today. Until then, stay, stay frosty. frosty.